Professor Evan Phelps, it's a great honor to welcome you to this conversation with Asia Times. I'm David Golden, Deputy Editor for Business for Asia Times. Uh, I have to say personally, it's an enormous pleasure for me. I've known your work for nearly five decades, starting as a graduate student. I've known you personally for probably half that time. Uh, and I have to say, among all the Nobel laureates in economics, uh, we can fairly say of your work that you've done some of your most important work after receiving the Nobel Prize in 2006. Uh, I refer to your 2013 book, Mass Flourishing, and a subsequent book you wrote with a number of colleagues called Dynamism about what actually drives uh, extraordinary periods uh, of economic growth. And now your white paper for Asia Times, uh, which we released today, I think is a major contribution to the world discussion about uh, economic growth, economic policy, US-China relations and ancillary topics. So welcome uh, and thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you, David, for inviting me. Good to be here. It's our great pleasure. Professor Phelps, you said that the concept of mass flourishing is your most important contribution to economics. As I said, that would make you the only Nobel laureate to publish his best work after winning the Nobel Prize. Could you give our listeners a capsule exposition of mass flourishing? And I hope that will persuade them to read your Asia Times white paper as well as your books, Mass Flourishing and Dynamism. Yeah, let's hope that your, our listeners um, take a look at, the, at that um, publication. Um, well, the first theme of uh, mass flourishing is, is that the century long explosion of innovation uh, in the West in the 19th century came from the imagination and creativity of people from various backgrounds and interests, not from the discoveries of navigators and a small number of scientists generally elsewhere in the world. The second theme uh, uh, of mass flourishing is that the experience of conceiving and creating new ways and new things and being involved in all that was hugely rewarding to people, maybe more important than the resulting gains in productivity. Among the many honors you've received, one of special interest to our readers, we're Asia Times, of course, is the China Friendship Award. That was presented to you by Chinese Premier Li Keqing. Uh, your book, Mass Flourishing, uh, was a bestseller in Chinese translation. Uh, Premier Li praised your contribution to Chinese efforts at innovation. What can you tell us about your conversation with Chinese leaders and their interest in your work? Well, I, I've been fortunate to have three meetings with Premier Li. As you can imagine, he has a wide range of interests. So we talked about several things over the years. In those meetings, innovation was a subject that always came up. He was keenly interested in entrepreneurship as well. I remember how delighted he was uh, to inform me of the rapid rate of new firm formation that was encouraged, that was occurring in China. Let's talk for a second about the global dimension of, uh, of dynamism, which of course is one of the principal subjects of your white paper and your books. The title of your white paper is Economic Dynamism and the Global Economy. You and your colleagues have compared endogenous innovation, that is innovation taking place in a single country, and imported innovation, the transmission of innovation among countries, amongst the major Western economies. Can you say something about innovation as a global phenomenon? Well, uh, in the 19th century, only a handful of nations conceived and developed indigenous innovation, innovation springing up 
from the nation uh, at, at, at any rapid rate. For economic growth, most of the world, most of the world was largely dependent for their economic growth on the innovation of about four countries, uh, Britain first, America, then um, Germany and France. But now innovation, I would say, has become a global phenomenon, uh, as you call it. Uh, uh, but it has to be said that despite this democratization, uh, the global rate of indigenous innovation and the indigenous innovation uh, in the present decade seems to be uh, no larger than it, uh, than it, uh, not larger, not larger than it was uh, uh, from 1870 to 1970. In other words, there's been no general, um, there, in general, innovation has not speeded up around the world. And it's in fact slowed down in those four countries I mentioned at various times uh, in recent decades. Uh, but some other countries of course have picked up in, in their uh, rate of uh, innovation. And one of those countries I'm sure we'll be getting to in just a minute. Uh, just of course the subject of China's capacity to innovate has been one which has been debated uh, hotly, if not rapidly, uh, in the West. Uh, and that's a great segue to talk about China. Uh, in your white paper, you wrote, if I can quote, after the launch of reform and opening up, China's innovation was predominantly imported, although at some point in the present decade, indigenous innovation became significant. But as China runs out of foreign innovations it can import at acceptable cost, its focus is now on indigenous innovation. Now, do you see China, do you expect China to become an exporter of innovation uh, like Western countries? Well, it seems to me that such an exportation of, of new methods and products would be uh, a very uh, natural outcome. Uh, and, and that will be um, interesting to watch. Yes, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, interesting to think that um, the US and Britain held up, uh, pushed forward the world in the 19th century and, and then the United States pretty much by itself kept things going uh, over the first two thirds of the 20th century. And um, now maybe we can look to uh, China to carry the ball, to, to, uh, to, to make a big contribution to uh, advancing productivity uh, in the rest of the world. That's a, that, that's a big statement and one I, which, uh, as I'm sure you know, is, uh, is controversial uh, in the United States. If we could talk for a moment about the wellsprings of innovation, the sources of it, uh, in the white paper you wrote that the sort of economy that people want, and I quote, would be fueled by the original ideas of creative people and developed by entrepreneurial people alert to new opportunities and keen to start new businesses and developing new concepts into commercial products and methods and marketing them to potential users. This is the China that I hope will emerge. Uh, you've personally observed China over many years. You've spent uh, uh, a great deal of time speaking, teaching, meeting uh, leaders in politics and business. Do you see the China that you hope to emerge actually emerging? Well, um, all of that is, I think is, is uh, occurring some parts more than others. Um, there's been a huge rise in the number of firms over the past couple of decades uh, in China, 
I have seen with my own eyes many amazing new products and methods created in China. It's not just abstract. I've been in the factories and been in the companies and I've just been bowled over by uh, what I've seen. Though I admit I don't go to many American factories. Um, the resulting acceleration in the rate of growth of what economists call total factor productivity uh, in China has not risen much, but that may be in lar large part because much of China is not developed in, and, and, and is not growing at a rapid rate. Once, once, the, once innovation is starting, it is going on over all of China, I, I think we'll see amazing uh, aggregate numbers. If we could turn back to the West for a second, uh, let me quote again what you wrote in your white paper. The West is in crisis and so is economics. Rates of return on investment are meager. Wages and incomes generally are stagnating for most people. Job satisfaction is down, especially among the young and more working age people are unwilling or unable to participate in the labor force, end of quote. When you look at the world economy with your decades of perspective on this, what worries you the most? And conversely, looking at the world, what gives you the most reason for optimism? Well, um, being an American, I, I worry about what appears to me to be a fall of interest in exploration and creation and a rise of interest in making fortunes. I think we also have witnessed um, in America businesses spending more time seeking advantages from the government and politicians and spending more time seeking donations from business than used to be the case, which is certainly harmful in all sorts of ways. I also worry about the damage being done by global warming and now by the coronavirus. We all have to hope that there is more international cooperation on these, uh, on these two fronts. Uh, Professor Phelps, if we could talk about the economics profession for a moment, which you view, of course, from the pinnacle as a Nobel laureate. Uh, in your white paper, you've said some very critical things about the standard macroeconomic model, the default way in which economists look at the economy as a whole. Uh, we have many readers who are students, students of economics. What advice would you give today to a young person starting out to learn economics? Well, I think it's very important for young people studying economics to understand that there is a significant variety of perspectives and none of the existing theories take account of everything that is important. Uh, they don't take account of all the different dimensions of the problem. They don't spend the time to uh, acquaint themselves with alternative views. So um, I, I, I think uh, we, we could make um, a lot of progress on that. Uh, that in other words, I, I, I think the, the way that economics is presented to students uh, it leaves some something to be desired. If we could drill down into the issue for, for a moment. Uh, in your white paper, uh, one of the issues that you cite uh, regarding the economic profession is it's, and I quote, continuing neglect of imperfect knowledge. Uh, and you write, in the interwar years, Frank Knight and John Maynard Keynes launched a radical addition to economic theory. Uh, Knight's book, Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit, published in 1921, and Keynes thinking behind his general theory of employment, interest, and money from 1936, 
argue that there is no basis and could be no basis for models that treat decision makers as having correct models with which to make decisions. Knight, uh, and I'm still quoting, injected an uncertain future. Keynes added the absence of coordination. But subsequent generations of economic theorists generally disregarded this breakthrough. Uncertainty, real uncertainty, not known variances, is not normally incorporated into our economic models. The uncertainty revolution still has not succeeded. Now, surely the issue of uncertainty and imperfect knowledge has consequent implications for economic policy. What can economists do to help policymakers do their job better? Oh, good. Oh, sorry. Um, well, owing to uncertainty, um, markets are, are not able to act uh, quickly, uh, to f and so the markets don't quickly find their way to equilibrium, and and that's why, as uh, Keynes emphasized, government intervention is often advisable, and uh, I I think that's that's a um, that that that's a theme that uh, is resisted uh, in, in 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 some quarters in economics, and it's it's maybe overblown in some other quarters, which finds no use for markets at all. So uh, yeah, we have a, a lot of ways to uh, go, a lot of ways, a lot of room for improvement uh, there. As a teacher, uh, Professor Phelps, you've taught and interacted with Chinese students over, over many years. What's your impression of the next generation of uh, up and coming Chinese economists and Chinese leaders, the people you've met at Chinese uh, universities? Well, um, in early 2000, the year 2000, I had the good fortune. Hmm, pardon me? I'm sorry, 2010. <laughs> made a little mistake here. In early 2010, I had the good fortune to be appointed dean of the newly created New Wadu Business School in Fuzhou. And I, I met numerous students there and, and uh, many more in my tours around China over the next six years. Um, I'll never forget the night when I was invited to give a lecture, lecture entitled Capitalism and Socialism at Peking University. The huge hall was packed. People were almost literally hanging from the rafters. And, and um, the students were visibly excited and so was I. So that was a, an introduction to uh, Chinese students. Some years later, I had the honor and the pleasure, twice in fact, of giving a, a top talk to students at Tsinghua University a, a wonderful uh, university, uh, as, as, as you know, and uh, as the world, I think, uh, knows. Many of those students were qu quite brilliant. I was hugely impressed. I was, it was also impressive to see how knowledgeable and how eager and optimistic the Chinese students uh, are. And Professor Phelps, what advice would you give to the new U.S. administration, the Joe Biden government? And what advice would you give to the Chinese government uh, correspondingly? Well, I think it's important for, for the U.S. government to grasp that China has come to be a technological and cultural equal. equal. China continues to work hard to eliminate poverty, while America has not done enough. I hope the Chinese government will continue to encourage and support the formation of startups with new and innovative ideas. Uh, I would like to express my hope that both governments try from now on always to be open to discussion and to work at surmounting the huge distrust 
that has arisen in the past few years. Um, the US government, I think, ought to address immediately Trump's restrictions on Chinese students in America for the mutual benefit of American universities and Chinese students. Cooperation between the two countries can, I think, bring some huge mutual gains. China and America having the world's two giant economies must work together to rid the world of the COVID virus and all its mutations and to put an end to the deterioration of the Earth's atmosphere, oceans, and climate. America and China could also cooperate in setting pollution standards for adoption by both America and China, which would set a standard for the rest of the world. Also, these countries could organize laboratories in which American and Chinese scientists could collaborate in gaining further scientific understanding of viruses and finding new methods of climate control. So I, the message I would impart is that the two countries and the rest of the world have much to gain from such cooperation. Professor Evan Phelps, Asia Times is deeply grateful to you for the white paper, uh, which you uh, written for us and which we released today and for your time with us today. I'm sure all of us uh, and uh, China in particular looks uh, looks forward to the day when you can visit China again and continue your advice and counsel, uh, which has been so well received in China in the past. And thank you very much for this discussion. And thank you, David. Thank you thank very you. much for the invitation and and for your um, wonderful idea to, to do that white paper and for um, taking the time to uh, do this very nice interview.